Where are we studying? We're studying the book of Ephesians. So let's go there. I'm glad you're here on a Wednesday night. Glad you're here. Uh, could we do other things? And I thank you, thank you for giving your attention to the word of God. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you tonight if I can find Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 is where we were last time. And so our endeavor here is to study the book of Ephesians, but we're going to do it my way, the way the Holy Ghost deals with me. So we're not going to do a line upon line necessarily every time, but just as I read the next part, what jumps out to me. And so what jumped out today is starting, uh, we finished up with verse 6 where we've been raised up together. Hallelujah. Have you been raised up together with him? And so then we'll start at verse 7. That in ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. How many of you know, God has always been rich in grace and God has always been kind. God did not just be kind, become kind when Jesus came. God has always been kind. God has always been good. God has always been love. Sometimes we have to watch as New Testament believers. We think, well, he was angry, but now Jesus came and now he's kind. But he's always been kind. He's always been kind. He's always been good. Amen. And so it was of his grace and his kindness that he sent Jesus. For by grace are you saved. Remember verse 5, by grace are you saved. So here it is again, by grace. What is grace? Grace is God's side. You cannot, grace is what God offers. You can't do God's side. You can't offer yourself this. What did he offer you? He offered you salvation. That's grace's side. That's God's side. And so, yes, you need to study what God has offered you. And if you study on grace, you'll you'll hear everything that God has offered. But if you never study on the next part, what is the next part? It says, by grace are you saved through faith. Everybody say, through faith. Now, there's sometimes that it, all some people want to do is talk about faith, and that's right. You know, I, I did a series on Sunday morning not long ago, uh, you know, basically, are we a grace church or a faith church? The answer is yes. Uh, we are a grace church because everyone's picking sides today, but there's no need to pick a side because you need both sides. Because if you only teach on grace, then you're going to get greasy. What do I mean by that? Well, the, nothing matters. Or if you get just teach faith and you don't teach God's side, where you've got to do something, you get very works-minded. So you need both. And so you receive everything. Are you all right? Everybody okay? Ever say, it's, it's by grace, through faith. Hallelujah. So that's God. Less, not of works, lest any man should boast. So how many of you know there is nothing you can do works-wise to get born again? There's a lot of times people, uh, and I tell this story, if you've been through my um, uh, uh, Bible Institute class, I think it's, uh, I don't remember which one, but uh, I, I think it was being led. I tell this story all the time. Pastor Rhonda and I were on a walk, and we were in either Alabama or Tennessee. I say Tennessee. She says Alabama. She's probably right. But I refuse to say, if she wasn't here, I would tell everybody I was right, because I I swear it was Tennessee. But anyway, we were walking through the woods, and uh, there was a couple. At that time, we were in our um, probably 30s, and they were in their 70s, and uh, they were whooping us. In other words, uh, they were, you know, we were like at the same time, but they were always at the rest stop. You're supposed to look around everything. They were always there first, and we were were there later. Hallelujah. And when the first time I got there, the Holy Ghost said to me, he said in my heart, not out loud, he just said, um, Talk to him and get him born again. And so being the great man of faith preacher, pastor of a church that I am, I did not. Because uh, one-on-one was hard for me. Give me a pulpit and the grace and the anointing and I can do it. One-on-one was hard for me, even as a pastor. So I feel you. That's why we have Aldo and he's helping us. <laughs> but I've gotten way over that a long time. Long, that was third. That was 25, 27, 28, 30 years ago. Uh, so I've gotten way over that. But that's where I was. So we go. So they take off. We all take off the same time again. Or they get a little bit of ahead of us. We get to the second one. The Holy Ghost says, minister to him. And once again, I did not. And about the third one, somebody on the inside is getting irritated with me. And yet, on the third one, I still didn't do it. Now someone 
is beyond irritated with me. And so I said, Lord, please forgive me. <laughs> Have you ever had to ask the Lord to forgive you and stuff like this? I said, find a way. I, will, I promise you if I run into him, I promise you if I run into him again, I will. Now, the, the answer to the story is, so there was a bathroom place there, and we were there. And so I was like, well, I gave him my word, and I'm, I'm, I'm on it. So we began to talk, and we worked some things around. And we finally got to some places where I could kind of pin him down into some things. And uh, he said to me, well, I hope I've done enough good works. And anytime someone says the pearly gates, I, I mean, you know, there's not going to be somebody... Peter's not standing at the pearly gates. Your name's either written or it ain't. You're either in or you out. There's no, there's no process in center. You either went to hell or you went to heaven. And so uh, he said to me, well, I hope I've done enough good things. So what do I immediately know? He's not born again. So I began to talk to him about good works is not going to get you anywhere. You have to believe on Jesus Christ. So I preached to him very simple, not preach, but I just talked to him about Jesus, about getting his sins forgiven. And so he got born again at the bathroom in Tennessee, uh, in, in, in Alabama. Uh, and uh, so after I got him born again, he offered me a job. Yeah, he was the head deacon in a large church in Birmingham who was... He was the man searching for the next pastor of that large church. And he offered me a job. And we were really small back then. And it was second, just seconds of tempting. Because I knew with it would probably come a huge salary. But I told him, I said, listen, they're not going to like me there. <laughs> they're not going to like me at all. But the point is, it's, you, you and I know this, but it's good to rehearse it. Don't ever assume because you live in Alabama or go to Tennessee or whatever you do, that everybody's born again. And if the Holy Ghost deals with you, it's by grace, through faith, that people are born again, not of works, okay? Now, if you just stop there, like a lot of people seem to want to do today, so I, I got you all in agreement. Everybody knows that, right? That if you're saved, it's not by works, now, there's a group of people today say, hallelujah, hallelujah, there's no working, there's no working, there's no working. And, but he does, he's just he's differentiating salvation by grace through faith with no works attached to it, but he doesn't just stop there. It says in verse 10, for we are now his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus, Christ comes first. Notice, notice the, when it, Christ comes first, uh, deity first, the anointing first, Jesus, unto good works. Everybody say, unto good works. So you're born again, not by works, but by grace through faith, but you have been ordained. Okay, now don't leave me, y'all. You have been created in Christ Jesus for good works. Amen. Everybody say good works. good works. Which God has before ordained that you should walk in them. What are them? The good works. What are the good works? What are the good works? Well, there's many good works, but um, it'd be easy to say, uh, and, and you don't have to do it, and, and, and no, but this is Wednesday night, so this is the core of the apple. So you're all good with me. I know you're all good with me. So I know, I know you all love me, but you ought to be able to do one, two, three, just by, oh, these are the good works that I'm doing. You shouldn't have to think about it. This is what I'm doing for God. This is how I'm serving God. This is what I'm doing in the church. I mean, if this is your home church, you ought to be doing something. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. There's something going on in the world right now and in the body of Christ that it's the influence of the God of this world. And he used the pandemic and he, he's using new thinking to, to um, try to pull us away from the word of God. Therefore, to pull us away from our blessing and really to pull us away from our faith working. Now, stick with me. I'm going to teach this, and I'm going to be really strong about it, but you can all handle it. Hallelujah. Because it's not just for you, because I'm going to get to some things in the other end. That I, if you, 
As a born-again believer, part of the body of Christ, God needs you in many ways. Yes, God can do whatever he wants to do. He's God, but he does need our help, and that's the way he set it up. Amen. Amen. That's the way he set it up. He left it with a bunch of guys who didn't look like they had it all together. But, the, you know, I used to have people say to me, uh, you know, well, the Holy Ghost uh, trusted men. And uh, I was praying about that, how he trusted me. Thank you for trusting me. And you know what the Holy Ghost said with me? He's like, he didn't trust you. He trusted me. <laughs> it's like, what? He trusted me in you. He didn't trust you. He trusted me. It's like, oh, well, that'll knock you down a few notches. Thank, do you have the Holy Ghost? He lives in you. Yes. All right. So it says, for we are his workmanship. Say, I am his workmanship. Yes. What are you doing? Created in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ? Yes. What are you created to do? Good works. Can you, can you peg two or three off real quick? Hallelujah. Which God has ordained that you walk in. And that kind of means you don't get to choose them. You get to pray about it and find out what they are. But if you don't know what they are, do something. Till you figure out what they are, praise the Lord. Wherefore, remember that you being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, uh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision flesh. Okay, so I decided, yeah, I, I remember. I decided to stop at 10. All right, all right. So, okay, because I was going to go on and do something, but the Holy Ghost told me to slow down and do this tonight. Because I was going to do two or three, but he said to camp on this one. So let's look at 1 Peter chapter 4. So how many know you're saved to serve? Yes. Everybody say that. Say, I was saved. To serve. serve. Who are you supposed to serve? Well, number one, I'm supposed to serve God. And then what does that look like? Well, if I serve God, I'm going to end up serving people. And what kind of people? Well, first, I'm going to serve the people of God. And then I'm going to serve just people, people. What does it look like? Well, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Turn to your neighbor, shout across the room if you have to. You got a gift. Everybody in this room. Is there anybody in this room who's born again that doesn't have a gift? You may not know what your gift is, but God gave you a gift. God gave you a gift. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety. So your spiritual gifts are not like mine, but you still got some. Amen. Amen? There's a great variety of spiritual gifts. Aren't you glad God's a God of variety? Amen. Look around the room. He's a God of variety. Hallelujah. He didn't create just one kind of apple. How, there's lots of them. Not just one kind of tree. There's all kinds of trees. Just not one color. Aren't you glad? You could, multiple colors of everything. There's a variety of spiritual gifts. Yours may not be mine, and mine may not be yours, but yours are just as important as mine. Use them well. So what do you got to do with it? Use it. Use it. When you give someone a Christmas gift, you want them to, unless it's just one of those things you sit around to look at, um, but, you know, at least that, that, then they should look at, sit at somewhere where they can see it. But if you give someone a gift to wear, uh, uh, to have something to you, you want them to use it. God wants you to use your gifts well to serve one another. That's his desire. Verse 11, do you have a gift of speaking? I do. Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. That's why I always pray, Lord, uh, I speak through me like a, a, as an oracle of God. Because it's not me talking. I want it to be him. Do you have the gift of helping others? And you all do. The answer to this one is yes. Do you have the gift of helping others? Yes. Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. So even when he asks you to do something, you don't have to do it in your own strength. Because if you do it in your own strength or without the grace of God, you're going to get tired of it. You're going to get weary of it. Amen. Amen. That everything you do will bring what? Glory. Everything you do will bring what? Glory. Glory to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Can I get an amen? Amen. That's what he's saying. Amen. This is important. 
So one of the things I want to tell you in Ephesians 2.10, which I do teach on this uh, uh, in Bible Institute a lot. Um, I bring it up when I'm ministering to ministers. I think I have recently just the, the, when I did my last series on uh, finding your destiny, you know, plan A. But I just, I, and I was really just going to buzz over it. I was going to go on to the fellow citizens and, um, you know, uh, circumcised versus uncircumcised. I was going to get into it, but the Holy Ghost just really brought me back. Because it seems as though he wants something solidified in our church, and this is a good place to do it on a Wednesday night. Um, We are born again to serve God. We don't do things to get born again. But it's a huge part of the kingdom of God and a huge part of God's plan. Listen to me. He created things to do for you before you were in your mother's womb. He ordained you. He gifted you something. And let's, I'll just interject this because it's popping up on my heart. You do know how it irritates the Lord when he gives you something and you don't do anything with it. We use the, the parable, and this is kind of where it gets out. When it's talking about the talents, it's talking about dollars. It's talk, so, you know, one talent is either worth one or two million dollars in today's society. So that's talking about money. But the, the thing applies that faithfulness is everything to God. It is required of it. See, God's even looking at how you handle money, um, you know, because we always say around here it's a test. Because he's looking to see how you handle a natural thing so he can get you a spiritual thing. And then so we should be beyond messing with money and does God want us to tithe and does God want us to give and does God want us to steward our money? Does he care? We should, that's, that's so, mm, I wish we could get beyond it because it's really just the thing that should be forever settled that God looks at how I handle money to determine if I am, am I ready for anything spiritual. So no wonder the devil works morning, noon, and night to keep the body of Christ uh, unsure about money and mad about money and yes, preachers do this and blah, 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 blah. I don't care, but the word of God says that he uses money as a test. And the unfortunate thing is most born-again believers are flunking the test. And therefore, the power of God. Could it be that because we don't know how to handle money, because we don't get over it and just do what God says with it, that that's why the anointing may not be as strong body-wide as it needs to be? Yeah, but this preacher, and I don't care about this preacher and that preacher. What does the word say? The word says that we're to tithe and to give and that, that if you can't handle filthy mammon or money, and it can't be dirty, you know, if you ever worked at a bank, you need to wash your hands, right? I mean, but the truth of the matter is he's just talking about it. it's just natural. It's just natural. But it's a big deal. And then everything God gives us, he wants us to be faithful with it. So my point to you is this. If he got irritated at the guy who he gave a gift to, that he gave that talent to, and he didn't do with it, and he said, take it away from that wicked, lazy servant and give it to the one who has the most, then you can just see, that this. listen to me, this seems important to God more than I realize. That everybody, he's given us a gift. He's given you a gift. And it was precious to him. So I didn't just randomly select something. I thought of you and who you would be. And I specifically selected something just for you. Now go and use what I have given you. Wow. I didn't think that one up. In case you're new, tongues and interpretation still in the Bible, still real, Holy Ghost still real. Wow. You might want to think on that one a minute. He said, what? Wasn't, didn't randomly. He thought about you. He thought about you. He thought about what would bless you and how you could bless others. And he gave you that gift. And some of you in this room, you've let others strip away that gift by comparing yourself with other people. Or you you stepped out to do something and maybe you didn't do it just right. And someone belittled you. Or some pastor didn't didn't help you get to where you needed to go. Or a family member, you know, uh, made fun of you. But that gift is still there. And God wants you to get some things healed so that you can activate your gift. 
And no matter your age or where you're at or in your, whether you just got born again or came back to the Lord last week or you've been serving him, you know, for 50 years, there's something for you to do. Guess what? In God, you never get to retire. He's never going to say, you got everybody born again that you need to. If that's the truth, then you know it's time to go. But if you're still here, there's still things you've got. Hallelujah. Well, that was good. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 5.10. i got to hurry. Hallelujah. I don't really have to. You'll be back next week. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Now, man, is this scripture being misused and abused today. Well, God made me this way. God doesn't make anybody to sin. God made me this way. Baloney. No. That's just a total misuse of Scripture. It's not true. God didn't make anyone to sin. Well, I just lie. I'm good at it. God must have made me this way. Well, you need to get born again. You need to put your flesh under. And that goes with everything. You know, I'm married, but, you know, my wife even knows that, and I'm not talking about me, all right, here. Um, But, you know, I just got a wandering eye, and God just gave me that, and, you know, she's okay with it, and God's okay with it, and I'm okay with it. Well, that's a lie. That's adultery. This is Wednesday night, so you all won't mind this one. Well, we're just living together to try this thing out to see if it'll work. It's the new way. You know, it's better when you live together first to see if it's going to work. No, it's still sin. You can't change him. You can let him change you. And he's still working on me. And he's going to still work on you. Praise the Lord. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. So this thing, these gifts that God gave you was by grace. So that's why it's working here together. He said, yes, your grace to be saved. Um, and that's just a free gift. And you do that through faith. But there's some more kinds of grace. And this is a serving grace. And I gave every one of you a grace gift. I gave every one of you something to do. Yeah, if you're not a, if you're not a speaker, if you're not a teacher, that's great. But I've given you something to do. I've empowered you. I've graced you. I've given you the ability. And then the Apostle Paul says, by the grace of God, I am who I am. If you want to identify yourself, you're a son or a daughter of the Most High God. Your citizenship is in heaven, and then you can begin to identify yourself as this is what I do to serve my God. That grace was bestowed on me, but I got to make sure it wasn't in vain. In other words, I'm not sitting on my gift. I'm not burying my gift. But I labored more abundantly than you all. In other words, with that gift, there's labor. There's no labor to get born again. There's no labor to believe that you received. You just do that through faith. And then the labor is to stay at rest. But when you get born again, labor is involved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the way it was delivered to me. I'm going to deliver it to you the way it was delivered. Come on, there's labor involved. I have watched, I've been pastoring for 30 years. I've watched people do this. When life gets hard, when life gets messy, the first thing they do is quit serving God. Not in the way that they quit reading their Bible, not in the way that they quit praying, but whatever they're currently doing for God, the devil talks them into taking a break at the very time they ought to be pushing in and actually maybe doing a little more. Now, I want to tell you this. Our church is known as a spiritual hospital. And sometimes people come here and they have been beaten up. They have been used and abused. Nursery workers that come and they haven't been in a service for two years. They need some word. They need some water. But even at that, there's a place. I'm just telling you, there's a place that God's going to have you serve. Because... There's a grace that goes with it that is just not for an hour and a half on Sunday morning or an hour and a half on Wednesday. It sticks with you Monday at 7 o'clock when you go to work. That grace is on you. It's a spiritual principle. That grace just doesn't, well, that grace is just for serving here. No, that grace is for serving God. And you, everything you do, you do unto the Lord. And so that grace will remain on you and stick on you and it will help you even at work. It will. 
Hallelujah. But what does that grace do? It causes you to labor. Well, that sounds like work. Exactly. But what? But it's, not, but it's not you laboring. It's what? It's the grace of God laboring within you. That's why when you feel tired, I, I brought the worship team up here. I guarantee you on Monday, after, after they've done something, I bet more than one or two of them think, whew, sure didn't wish, I sure wish I didn't have to go to practice. Sure wish I didn't. Oh, I wish I wouldn't have signed up for that nursery 30 minutes early. Goodness. I'm going to miss my Starbucks today. Sure, it would be easier. But you've got to let that grace in you kick in and take over. I would hate to admit this to you, but you know I don't always feel like coming to church. <laughs> well, you have to. No, I don't. I got a bunch of people these days that can preach. I have found at the times that I feel like it the least, if I push through it the most, the blessings are the greatest. That's why I know when I don't feel like it, if I'll just push through, we'll have a fun night just like tonight. Hallelujah. But it's not me. What I got to do? I got to kick into the grace that's in me. All right, that was a good introduction. Hallelujah. So let's look at Ephesians 2.10 again. This is where we were. And you know this scripture, but let's look at it amplified. For we are God's own handiwork. In other words, he created us, his workmanship. We're recreated in Christ Jesus, born again. So that's everybody in the room, right? Let me look around. I know most of you. Yep, yep, yep. Born again, born again, born again, born again, born again. Everybody born again. Hallelujah. So what? So you're all born again. So what's next? Born anew, that we may do. Everybody say, I'm a doer. doer. You're all doers of the word. This is Cornerstone Word of Life Church. We're doers of the word of God around here, right? That I may do those good, good works, which God has predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prearranged ahead of time, that we should walk and then live in the good life which he prearranged. Yeah, I want to walk the path that he made for me, Pastor Mark. I, I believe that's talking about the path for my life. Yeah, but he inserted in there doing those good works are part of your path. Amen. You can't exclude it. You can't exclude Come on. Did I lose everybody? You can't exclude it. Amen. We got to do those good works. Amen. Everybody say, I'm ready to do good works. Woo, glory to God. 2 Timothy 3.17. That, that the man of God may be perfect. So that's talking about preachers. Well, is every, everybody in here is a man and woman of God. Amen. Even though it was, Paul was talking to Timothy, but every one of us, because his grace, is thoroughly furnished unto every and all good works. Amen. Everybody say, I'm furnished. I'm furnished. What does that mean? I have the equipment, I have the grace to do any good work the Lord would ask me to do. Amen. Amen. Everybody say, I'm equipped Amen. to do the good work the Lord has asked me to do. And I just want to throw this one in because I just love it so much. Anybody remember a girl named Tabitha? Right before she was raised from the dead. What were they doing? In Acts chapter 9, verse 36, they said, look at what Tabitha made me. Look at what Tabitha made me. Tabitha is a better name than Dorcas. Hallelujah. But this woman was full of good works. This woman was full of good works. This interesting thing to me, and I thought of this, and, and I usually don't give my opinion, but I think everybody loved this woman so much because she did so much to serve them that they were not willing to let her go. So, and, and, you know, and then so Peter was a writer. I mean, I, I, there may be a correlation here. I, I think if I'm dying and I haven't ever done anything and nobody cares about uh, Anyway, but you understand what I'm saying is, uh, yeah, maybe we went a little too far. Hallelujah. But I'm just saying is that, We need to do something. It's not about just receiving. It's about giving. God bless Tabitha. Amen. Amen. Just wanted to throw her in. Hallelujah. I was just thinking about her. So why, why the good works? And good works, you know, you think about just even around here. Uh, We sure love our nursery workers. 
I really, there were more nursery ministers because we don't babysit our children. Even from the infants, um, they do things with them spiritual. I mean, all throughout the whole children's ministry, it starts the soonest you bring them in, they begin. Pastor Rhonda set a course for them, um, and Deanna is now keeping that course, her and Bethany, um, just making sure our children are ministered to. So it's not just dumping a child off so that mom and dad can have a break. Um, It is important. And so, um, but why do we do good works? It does benefit people, but that's not the only thing it benefits. Watch some of these, Matthew 5, 16. It says, let your light so shine before men. How are you going to let your light shine? This little light of mine, how am I going to let it shine? That they may see your good works. You know, alms you do in secret and God rewards, but here your good works are supposed to be seen. That they may see your good works and what will happen? And glorify your father. The people who receive the good works that you've done, it will bring glory and honor to your father in heaven. Let your light shine before men. So when you're doing a good deed, when you're working, when you're serving people, serving God, it glorifies your father in heaven. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. This one, I don't know that I've ever preached out of this one this way, but the Lord just to me today, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that where is the time uh, they speak against you as evildoers? How many know everybody in the world's kind of mad at the church today? How many know Jesus said it would happen? I mean, he even went so far as to say, and I don't talk about this very much, and neither does anybody else, but if you look at the word, he's like, uh, I didn't come to bring peace. He's like, there's some families, they're going to get all tied up in knots over what I, about me. And there's some people that may not like you and even in your family. But watch this. Whereas they may speak against you as narrow, mean, just evil. We're not being evil. We're just following God. That they buy your good works. So how do you shut somebody up? (laughs) Just keep serving them. How do you love somebody? Just keep on doing good. Which they shall behold. Watch this. Glorify God in a day of visitation. I like a day of visitation. And so I'm wondering about this day of visitation and good works. And I never would correlate them together as I've taught on this for a long time. But there's something that just dropped in my heart today about a day of visit. How many would like God to, I mean, he's always here at Cornerstone. He manifests because you're here. You're the temples of the Holy Ghost. You bring him in. We see him all the time. But, but, and that's good. But there's something more about a visitation. I think the, the United States of America about went into tongues again. Hallelujah. There's something about the United States of America. I believe we're due for a visitation. We have sown missionaries and people all over the world. The Bible says whatever a man re- sows, that shall he also reap. Well, we've sown a whole lot. So I think we're due for a good reaping. And, Lord, we need a good reaping right now. Hallelujah. And so there's something about the day of visitation and your good works. And so, yes, good works are happening in the church, but good works happen on an outreach team. Good works happen while you're at work. Good works happen while you're at the ball field. Good works happen here. Good works happen there. But we're supposed to be doing good works. Amen? And why? So they, those that say we're evildoers, will behold the good works, and they, will, they even will glorify God in the day of a visitation. That's powerful. Hebrews chapter 10. Let us consider one another and provoke. What does it mean to provoke? To poke. Like I do, Pastor Rhonda at home, when you don't see it, Desi and I provoke her many times. Not unto good work, just if we can irritate her. Hallelujah. Because she's very easy to irritate. And she's like, pick on each other. And we're like, no, it don't work because we don't care. And so, but let us consider one another and provoke. But how are you supposed to, so what are you supposed to be doing? This is Wednesday night, and so I'm going to ask you to do something. Even on Sunday mornings, the person that sits next to you, 
Because I know everybody in this room is serving. You could all list your one, two, threes just like that fast. And this is your home church and you're all serving. So I, I get that. I know that. But there's other people who aren't. And so I'm not saying be mean, but hey, join me on the usher team. Hey, join me in the nursery. You only got to do it once, and it don't even have to be on the service that you normally come. You can come serve and then still go to church. Hallelujah. That's the benefit of going to Cornerstone. Hey, come join me in the parking lot. It only rains in Alabama occasionally. Hallelujah. Um, come join me, you know, on the media team. You know, we need to make sure that Pastor Mark looks good. We don't want to scare anybody. I need your help. Hallelujah. So, you know, come join me. Provoke one another to good works. How do you provoke one another by good works? Well, just you working and you serving. You know, I know around here even sometimes it looks like that we don't need any help because they're all, everybody's so good. But I guarantee you we're always going to need help. Amen. And it's not just about us needing help. It's about you obeying God. Amen. It's about you obeying God. This is just as much part of the word as by the stripes of Jesus you were healed. This is just as much as part of the word. You didn't like that, but it is. It's just as big. It's just as much. It was important to God. He took, you know, that tongue interpretation, that was a heavy one. Uh, he, he, he didn't randomly give you a gift. He thought about you. He thought about you when he formed you. Whew. Hallelujah. Consider one to provoke each other unto love and to good works. Hallelujah. Verse 25. This is the pastor's, every pastor's favorite verse. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. I'm glad you did. As the manner of some is. Listen, you can't help at home. You need to be a part. There are times when you can't always make it. And I know, I'm, again, I'm talking to the core of the apple here. Y'all are good. But listen, you got to provoke people. you got to help them understand that we need you and you need us. And it's good to come sharpen each other. It's good to be friends with one another. But not assembling is not scriptural. Yes. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And sometimes, you know, you, you have to do some different things. But this is in the Bible. Don't forsake getting together. Don't forsake going to a connect group. I mean, get involved. Befriend people. Um, a threefold cord is not easily broken. It took four guys, four good friends that you trusted to lower you down. Y'all know that what I'm talking about. Right? You, hey, if you're lowering me down on a cot, I've, I've watched them try to put up flags. The ushers around here, flags are falling down. They can't get them up at the same time. You know, if you're lowering me from a roof and there's four on each side, I trust you because I can't walk anyway. I'm going to fall. I'm going to do a face plant. Hallelujah. I trust you that, you know, maybe we practice this at home. I don't know. But um, I don't know. But, but everybody needs some friends they trust. Hallelujah. Amen. But exhort one another. So you and I are supposed to exhort one another. So we're supposed to provoke one another to love and good works. We're supposed to exhort one another to come and be a part because the day is approaching. These are the last days. This is later than it was yesterday. And it's going to keep getting later and later and later. And the world's going to keep getting darker and darker and darker. Amen. And then it won't be long till we'll hit gross darkness. Because you think it's dark now, but we haven't hit gross darkness yet. Yeah, it's going to be nasty. But you and I are going to be the light. When gross darkness hits, we are going to shine like light bulbs. And part of that is let your good works show before men that you can glorify God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, we'll skip that one. Let's do, um, so what's our attitude supposed to be? So let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 58. The other one was in James where it talks about how you uh, serve people humbly. Um, but I, I need to get going. So I want to look at this, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable. What are we supposed to be doing? Steadfast. That means I'm standing fast on this. You can't move me off of this. So we use that in our faith and we say, well, we got to be steadfast in the word unmovable. And that's good and that's right. But it's not talking about faith right here. It's talking about your work for the Lord. So what you do for God, you're supposed to be steadfast in it. No one and no circumstance should move you away from it. Right, always abounding. Everybody say always. always. Doing what? Abounding. 
overflowing in the work of the Lord. Your work is not the same as my work. The neighbor on the either side of you, you can't compare yourselves among yourself. You can only do what the Holy Ghost said to you. This is not a condemnation service. This is a come on, do what God wants you to do because there's something on the other side of this that he needs you to do. And he, he trusts that you can hear this with the right heart because he's trying to get you to a place that others aren't willing to go. He's trying to get you through a door that other people won't walk through. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain. How, aren't you glad that after you do serve the Lord and you serve one another, that God knows and he, he's watching and your labor is never in vain. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Titus chapter 2 verse 14. Amplified Classic says, Who gave himself on our behalf that he might redeem us, purchase our freedom. Aren't you glad you're redeemed? Amen. From all what? Iniquity. Uh, and purify for himself a people to be as peculiar his own people who are eager and enthusiastic. I'm eager. I delight to do your will, O oh God. I'm eager and enthusiastic, and I'm going to do whatever i got to do to get in my place. Amen. About living a life that is good and filled with beneficial deeds. Beneficial deeds. Throw that up in the New Living Translation in just a minute. It's not in my notes, but I want you to. Hallelujah. Someone up there serving the Lord, punching buttons. Hallelujah. Titus 2.14. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin to cleanse us and to make us his very own people totally committed to doing good deeds. Everybody say, I'm totally committed. Well, he freed you. He cleansed you. There's no sin. You're not a sinner anymore. Amen. We're his own. And I'm totally committed. Amen. Are you totally committed? Amen. Well, it's good. You're a preacher. You should be totally committed. Well, the same thing works for you. Amen. You're totally committed. Amen. To doing what? Not just, it, 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 listen to me. I, you, more than you would ever know. I appreciate you being on here on Wednesday night. I love teaching you all. I love my bunch. Um, the Lord has me go out every once in a while now, but I'm always happy to get home to my bunch. Hallelujah. I'm happy to get home to my worship team. I'm happy to get home to my people, your faces, hallelujah, that all don't look the same. I'm happy to get here. I love it, and I love you being here. But my job is to grow you up, Amen. especially this bunch. Amen. Hallelujah. And so you are, say it again, say, I am, I am. totally committed, totally committed. To, doing to doing good deeds. And then Colossians 1.10 says this. Colossians 1.10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. Yes, we love the increasing in knowledge, but what are you supposed to be? Fruitful. Fruitful. So um, the Lord, he seems really serious about this, and we've been praying on some things on Wednesday. But it seems real important for the body of Christ, and it seems like he wants us to get in a certain direction. I want you to look with me in Luke 13. We're going to start at verse 6 in the New Living Translation. Jesus told this story. A man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it. Now, let's just stop. What is fruit? Fruit that your fruit may abound. What is that? Doing good works. That's part of your, and see, we got to get out of that mindset. Well, fruit is, can be answered prayer. Fruit is fruit of the Spirit. But fruit, there's the fruit of good works. Amen. Amen. Abounding to your account. So here, what he's talking about um, is, is more of what, what this fig tree was supposed to do. What's, this, what's a fig tree supposed to produce? So you can make pudding or something or cookies. So you can eat it, right? But the guy who was in charge, the owner, was always disappointed. Because this tree had been there and been there and been there, and there were no figs and no fig. Jesus is pretty serious about this stuff. He cursed one of them. Verse 7, aren't you glad you're not cursed? Yes. Finally, he said to his gardener, hey, Pastor Mark, I've been waiting three years on so-and-so, and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taken up space in the garden. Aren't you glad? I don't know that that's totally what he said. But the connotation is there's a gardener, and it's been three years, and there's not been a single fig. 
And notice he said there hadn't been a single fig. And then what he say to it? Aren't you grateful for God's mercy and compassion and love? But he still thinks this way. Verse 8, this is Jesus talking. The gardener answered. The pastor answered. Sir, give me one more chance with them. Leave them alone for another year. And I'm going to give them some special attention. And I'm going to put some fertilizer on them. Now, the Amplified Classic we won't get into, but I do love it. It says I'm going to put some manure on them. And I don't know how that works. But I felt this really strong in my heart today. Um, Listen to me. God is not a taskmaster. And he's not going to cut you off from heaven. Aren't you glad? He's not going to put any sickness and disease on you. He's not going to cause you to get in a car wreck. He's not going to cause your dog to die. He's not going to cause you to fall down. He's not going to cause you to break your leg. I remember, you know, um, I had a, when I was in, I tell the story all the time. I don't know why. It even, it's not even, I don't, but I'm going to tell it anyway. When I was a little boy in the church that we were in, you know, the lady, not the pastor. The pastor wasn't in charge of our church. It was that lady that was in charge. Uh, the superintendent, they called her. She was in charge, not the pastor. He just spoke, and she probably told him what to say. But anyway, so, so I remember one time she got up, and she broke her leg, and she said, well, the Lord had dealt with me to slow down, and I didn't, and so he just broke my leg. How many of you know um, the Lord is not into breaking legs, and he's not into punishment? Jesus took your punishment. But on the same hand, you cannot operate in the blessings of the kingdom You can't inherit the blessings of the kingdom if you're not obeying. It's not about heaven or hell. That's been decided. That's been decided. Because a lot of places you study this where it talks about inheriting the kingdom, people translate that to mean, well, you can't go to heaven. That's not what it means. Heaven is established this only way. I believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. I, I receive him as my Savior, and I make him the Lord of my life. I am made a new creature in Christ Jesus. But when it talks about inheriting the kingdom, oh, that's for here on the earth. Jesus preached. I'll let you a little thing where we're going to get to originally uh, down the road a little bit on Sunday mornings, but not, not yet. But, but Jesus preached kingdom. And he's talking about the blessings of the kingdom, and he's the king of the kingdom, and, 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 and there's all kind of blessings of that kingdom. But everybody, even if they're part of the kingdom, they're going to inherit all the blessings of the kingdom because there's some rules and regulations of the kingdom. And this is part what I'm talking to you about, about how you inherit the blessings. That's why, oh, well, that makes good sense then while you were doing that. Yeah. Um, you know, he wanted you to see visibly that he's pleased with them um, serving And I believe he's about to make a witness out of all them about what it's like to serve God. Hallelujah. Because he blesses us. He's not taking stuff away, but, but, you know, this one's kind of, you know, the gardener said, give me another chance. Give me another year. And I'm going to give it special attention. So that's what I promised the Lord today. So I'm going to be getting you some fertilizer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Probably on Sunday mornings too. I'm gonna get you some fertilizer because uh, you know I don't care what everybody else is doing. I care about my assignment and I care about you. And whether you think I care about you right now, I am telling you this because there's some things in the Word of God that are very important about you serving, not just now, but what about for eternity? Sometimes in our circle, in our camp. We make everything about right now, but there is a heaven coming, and there is a judgment seat of Christ coming, and you're going to have to stand there, and forever it will be known. Thank God for people who get born again on their deathbed. My my spiritual father, you said, sure do beat going to hell. But There's no rewards because they didn't live their life for the Lord, but you are alive, and you've been given a gift. Yeah, but ask the Lord how to get around your butt. <laughs> um, okay, maybe that wasn't inspired. But um, how do you, Lord, because I have these real problems, limitations in time. I got four little children. Um, I homeschool. I this. But there is something that he will give you in your season to do. 
Because he's not going to exclude you. Amen. And he's not going to excuse you from the word. Is that right on a Wednesday night? Amen. Don't raise your hand. But how, how many have ever had the Lord ask you to do something and then you tell him why it can't be done? I used to be really guilty of that. He would give me something big and I'm like, you know. And one time he just got tired of it, I think. And he said to me, Mark, oh, anytime he calls you by your name, you know, you might be in trouble. You know, if you ever get a Mark, you know, all full of your name, you know, the Lord has never done that. Hallelujah, but Mark. I'm like, yeah. He said, what's an excuse? How many know when the Lord asks you a question, you don't know the answer? You might think you know the answer, but you don't know the right one. Because I thought all my excuses were valid. And you know what he said to me? An excuse is nothing more than an excuse. Stop it. There's a way around it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, y'all. We're living in such a great time. Cool things are happening here at the church, in the body of Christ. God's pouring out his spirit. I believe a visitation is coming. He just wants you in your place. Now, if you're in your place and you're in your grace, lift both hands and thank the Lord. You're doing what he told you to do with all of your heart. But if there's anything he ask you, and I'm going to say it again because he was reminding me again. There is seasons in people's life because that's why there's no guilt or condemnation. But you really better be in this season. If he sent you here and you're recuperating. We first had you in ICU. <laughs> and now you've been moved to a regular room. And it won't be long, you'll be in therapy. Hallelujah. <laughs> But then you're out the door. You know, the Lord told me something today that was very interesting while I was praying. And I, and I never had this kind of thing before. He said to me, it's like um, when a person is sick, he's like, the hospital is full of nurses. But it, if all the nurses left, it wouldn't matter how good the doctor was. They would get no help. And I thought about it and I said, that is true. So if you're a nurse, we appreciate you. But it takes everybody. It takes everybody. It takes every, Pastor Rhonda and I know this all so well. We cannot do what we do. Thank God for our wonderful staff, our growing staff, the, uh, our big staff. Hallelujah. I love each and every one of them. But we still need every one of you. So what is it the Lord's asking you to do? It may be small and some people, but it's like but Pastor Blood talked about the two mites. The same thing. It may be one time a month on a Sunday, you serve, you do something, but you're doing something. It may be seen, it may not be seen, but you're doing something. Just ask the Holy Ghost. Don't ask me. I mean, I plug you in somewhere. No, really what I'll do is I'll send you one of the associates, and they'll plug you in somewhere. But ask the Lord. Lord, and so, someone listen to me. It seems hard. And don't anybody leave tonight feeling condemned. Instead, Lord, I want to serve you. Tell me what to do. What am I supposed to do to serve you in this season of my life? And nobody in this room is looking around saying, I know they don't do anything. Well, you don't know because everything is not visible. You don't know. So this is really something between you and God. We can see the worship team serving because they're up here. You can see ushers because we give them a cool shirt. You can have one too. Hallelujah. <laughs> um, you know, but there's other parts of the church that you don't see. You don't always see who is clean in the bathroom, but aren't you grateful that it is clean? Amen. Hallelujah. It's not a scripture, but cleanliness is next to godliness. <laughs> and everything in order. Just taking a second. Again, don't you leave here condemned. If you leave here condemned, you let the devil jump on your shoulder. Don't you leave here condemned. Well, I'm not doing what I need to do. Well, you just ask the Lord, and he'll tell you. And he's not going to have you run a marathon 
before you get up out of bed. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you got to get up. You know, he's going to have you walk to the mailbox for first before he's going to have you run a marathon. So you just do something. If you pulled away from something because life got stressful, Lord, what do you want me to do? What can I do? You've graced me to do something. Thank you for my gift. Well, I don't know what my gift is. Well, just say, thank you for my gift. Well, there's no room here for my gift. You know, I want to preach. Well, that one's taken. <laughs> Pastor Rhonda said there's a street corner, though. Hallelujah. <laughs> or you can go with Aldo, and you can go places and preach, and you can go on a missions trip, and there's, there's all kinds of places. But, you know, before I was up preaching, I was ushering. Um, I was a youth minister. I was on the worship team. I was a cleaner. I've, shared, I've done my share of commodes. I, was, I, I had throne room ministry. <laughs> Clean the, the porcelain throne. Praise the Lord. I was a luggage handler for my spiritual mother. She had a pair of shoes for every outfit that she owned. Dear me. It wasn't always glamorous. But, and and I, I didn't, you're not doing anything to get promoted either. I would still be a youth pastor in Paris, Illinois, if the Lord would let me. I was having fun. I was enjoying it, changing people's lives. It's just about doing what God's called you to do. Okay? Go home. <laughs>